In this next section, we're going to learn about Ivan Pavlov. We'll learn about his studies and how he contributed to behaviorism. Ivan Pavlov is one of the best known individuals in the history of psychology, but he wasn't actually a psychologist. He was born in Russia and trained as a physiologist. Throughout his entire career, he considered himself to be a physiologist, not a psychologist. In fact, he didn't like psychology because at the time it was closely associated with introspection and introspection was not science, according to Pavlov. Many of us are familiar with Pavlov's classical conditioning studies and we'll cover these on the next few slides. His work was influenced by Darwin's 1859, Origin of the Species, and by Ivan Suchanoff's Reflexes of the Brain, which was published in 1863. Darwin's theory of natural selection highlighted the importance of the environment in inducing behavior. Suchanoff's work highlighted the connection between the environment and automatic responses, reflexes. Pavlov finished his medical degree at St. Petersburg University in 1883. He did not practice medicine. Instead, he worked as a researcher after graduation. He started working at the Institute of Experimental Medicine in St. Petersburg in 1891. His focus was on digestive systems. He was interested in how the process worked and how we might be able to solve different digestive issues that people were having at the time. While working at the Institute, he invented several new surgical procedures that he used to study the digestive system, but that could also be used to study other physiological processes. Because of the widespread use of these new procedures, Pavlov earned a Nobel Prize in 1904 for his work in digestion. Using the new procedures that he invented, he isolated different parts of dogs' digestive systems, their stomachs specifically, and collected gastric juices to study and to sell, that's right, sell to the public in order to fund his research. You can see in the figure here, he took a part of the larger stomach and sort of siphoned it off and separated it from the rest of the stomach. Now, what this did was it allowed him to collect uncontaminated juices from that part of the stomach. So by sectioning off part of the stomach, that, that part of the organ will still produce gastric juices when the animal eats. That is part of our physiology. When we eat, it sends a signal to our brain to send a signal to our stomach to start going through the digestive process. When the dogs ate food, their stomachs would begin this process and gastric juices would drip out of this miniature stomach. Now, why would anyone buy stomach acid from a dog? Because they were led to believe that it would balance out or cure their own digestive problems. He initiated this side business as a way to pay for the animals, their care, and the research that he was so passionate about. Weird, yes, but at the time, we didn't have grants and nonprofit organizations available to help acquire funds like we do today. Back then, you really had to find that money on your own. One of the reasons that Pavlov was so interested in digestion is because it's a reflex. It happens automatically. We eat food, the process begins. After his digestion studies, he became interested in another reflex, 
salivation. To study this reflex, he once again used dogs and he inserted these tubes up underneath their lips like this. You can see one of his stuffed dogs in the image there. There's a gland on the inside of the mouth that produces saliva. So he did the same thing with saliva that he did with the stomach acid. He collected it, he measured it. He didn't sell the saliva as far as I know, but he did collect it and take measurements. He wanted to know whether dogs salivate more when they eat dry food versus wet food. Go ahead and take a guess. What do you think? Does a dog create more saliva when it's eating wet food or when it's eating dry food? Dry food. That's what Pavlov discovered. Dry food has no moisture. And so the dog has to make up for that lack of moisture by creating more saliva. The body has a way of recognizing more saliva needed create more saliva. There's this feedback process that of course the brain is involved in. Pavlov was very interested in understanding how that reflex works. More saliva means the dog is able to break down that hard, dry food. With wet food, it's nearly broken down already. It's sort of just mush. So the dog does not need to create as much saliva in order to eat wet food. In the image on the right, you can see one of the preserved dogs. Later on in his career, he began removing the esophagus of his dog and replacing it with this contraption that allowed the food that a dog ate to just fall right back out of its throat into the bowl. And he did this because he didn't want to contaminate the juices. Students always want to know, did he ever feed these dogs? He did. When the dogs were participating in the experiments, he used these procedures. When the dogs were not participating, they were kept in cages. They were on a large property. They did have handlers and they were taken on walks. They didn't live a miserable life, but you can make your own judgments based on the pictures. After the turn of the century, Pavlov and one of his graduate students, Wolfson, accidentally discovered that some of the dogs would salivate before they ate their food. This isn't normal. Lions, tigers, and bears, and dogs and cats, salivate when they eat, not minutes before they eat. Pavlov's dogs were drooling, their heads were moving, and their mouths were moving before he even set the food in front of them. He would walk away for a few minutes to do something, and when he would come back, the tubes that he had inserted into these dogs' mouths had some saliva in it. He noticed this and spent nearly the rest of his life studying how reflexes can be induced by different stimuli in the environment. Sometime between 1902 and 1904, he began to study this puzzle. His research program was focused on how animals develop and get rid of learned reflexes. So he presented different things in the dog's environment. And over time, the dog began to associate that thing in the environment with the reflex, the response. His work would eventually help behaviorism emerge. One, because he used tightly controlled experiments to do his studies. And two, because his work was extremely popular at the time and well-known by many people, not just in Europe, but also in the United States. His work also became a big hit with those who were interested in controlling human behavior. The Soviet Union donated quite a bit of money in the early 1900s to fund Pavlov's research. What they were interested in is how his principles could be used to control individual people, 
to make them think a certain way, to make them act in a certain way. The Institute of Experimental Medicine was also supportive of Pavlov's research. In the 1910s, they built a special lab for Pavlov to conduct his research. It's called the Tower of Silence. This is a picture of Pavlov's laboratory. It gets its name because it was insulated to minimize the amount of sound coming from the building. As you can imagine, he had quite a few dogs living in this building. They barked, they made noises, some of them howled at night. And so the building was constructed so that other people on the campus would not be able to hear the dogs. It had several rooms. It had rooms for experimenting. It had rooms for the staff. It had rooms to take care of the animals. Let's take a look at Ivan Pavlov's original classical conditioning studies. We're going to break the process into three stages, before conditioning, during conditioning, and after conditioning. Here we have what happens before the conditioning process, before the animal actually participates in the experiment. We have the unconditioned response. In this case, it's drooling. This is the reflex. This is the behavior that happens automatically, the behavior that the animal does not have control over. What leads to this response? The unconditioned stimulus. Here, it's dog food. When the dog begins to eat the food, it automatically responds by drooling. This relationship between the unconditioned stimulus and the unconditioned response, it's a natural connection. It exists in the wild, it exists at birth. We also have what he called a neutral stimulus. It's the thing in the environment that he picked to associate with the response. In some of his studies, he used a bell. I have a whistle here. The neutral stimulus does not lead to the response that we're focused on. In this case, we're looking for drool. A whistle, a bell is not going to lead to drooling before conditioning. So we call the whistle, we call the bell, the neutral stimulus. It has no association yet with the response. During conditioning, the two stimuli are paired together again and again and again. The neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus are paired together repeatedly. In Pavlov's original studies, he used a bell and presented it every time he fed the dogs. After conditioning, the neutral stimulus is called the conditioned stimulus because it will now elicit the conditioned response. Keep in mind too that the conditioned response and the unconditioned response are the same behavior, drooling in both situations. After conditioning, the bell, the whistle, will lead to drooling just as the food had done. This only happens when the two stimuli are repeatedly paired together. Even in the absence of the food, the bell will lead the dog to drool. In order to get rid of, extinguish this pairing between the whistle and the behavior, we simply stop presenting the neutral, the conditioned stimulus. Eventually, that association will go away. Pavlov studied dogs and their reflexes. Let's apply classical conditioning principles to two real life examples. Before conditioning, a virus causes vomiting. That is a natural pairing. Viruses in nature do cause nausea and vomiting. Before conditioning, soup does not cause vomiting. During conditioning, the soup and the virus are paired together. Many of us, when we get sick, 
we do in fact eat soup, maybe soup and crackers. Maybe some of you have some other type of food that you would like to eat whenever you don't feel well. After conditioning, when the virus is no longer present, but we eat that particular type of soup, we might actually feel nauseous and we might vomit. The tendency for this kind of association to happen is one of the reasons why doctors who treat cancer patients sometimes order foods that people wouldn't normally eat outside of the hospital. So they might order banana ice cream for the patients. Banana ice cream isn't something that most of us can find in the grocery store. If cancer patients develop an aversion toward banana ice cream because it's been conditioned to elicit a nauseous, a vomiting reflex, if this is the case, it shouldn't impact the patient outside of their treatment. They will go back home and they'll be able to eat vanilla ice cream, chocolate ice cream, butter pecan ice cream, any other type of ice cream except banana flavored ice cream. Here is another real life example that many of you have probably experienced but didn't realize what was going on and probably didn't realize that it was related to classical conditioning. In this example, before the conditioning occurs, a pleasant scent results in a pleasant mood. But the store that sells the scent does not elicit this positive mood. The scent does, but walking into the store has zero effect on the consumer. The conditioning process happens when you shop at the store. Some retailers will spray scents throughout the location in an effort to condition you to feel more positively toward that store. After conditioning, the store itself now elicits the positive reaction. We don't need the perfume, we don't need the scent the name alone or the store alone is associated with positivity. Retailers hope that by doing this, they can get you to come back to the store and spend more money. After more than 25 years of research, Pavlov published his classical conditioning principles in 1927. He focused on physiological responses, on reflexes. When we talk about B.F. Skinner next week, you'll notice that Skinner focused on learned behaviors, on voluntary behaviors. B.F. Skinner did not focus on reflexes. In his book, Pavlov encouraged researchers to focus on these reflexes. He did not see a need to focus on psychological processes. He also described the procedures that he used to develop and extinguish the reflexes. And he described how he controlled the environment, how he set up the experiments to minimize the impact of other stimuli in the environment. His classical conditioning studies were not his only contribution to behaviorism. Between 1891 and 1904, he supervised more than 100 graduate students. We learned earlier in the semester that Wilhelm Wundt supervised 186 dissertations. Both of these numbers are impressive. That means they supervised several graduate students each year. That is difficult even by today's standards. Pavlov's work took some time to make its way to the United States. It was written in Russian and it wasn't translated into English until the 1920s and 1930s when American psychologists were able to read firsthand about his studies. They were much more interested in how they could do their own variations of his studies and how they could apply his principles to the already popular behaviorism. 
His work inspired many other psychologists, including John Watson, who we'll talk about next, B.F. Skinner, and also Walter Miles, who studied rat learning using mazes. Although the classical conditioning studies are well known, Pavlov's greatest contribution to behaviorism was likely his research program in general. His method of conducting research became the model for American psychologists. Each one of his studies investigated just a small piece of the bigger puzzle. He did not try to tackle the entire problem with one study. He broke the problem into components, and then he designed studies to test these different components of the larger problem. The results of the study might spark new questions, or if the results can't be replicated, then he would go in a different direction. His methods were objective, precise, standardized, his lab was very organized and all of the researchers had to follow a very specific detailed protocol. He also prepped all of his animals for surgery. As you can imagine, a lot of graduate students wanted to work with Ivan Pavlov. He would pair his new research assistants with a more experienced RA in order for them to learn the ropes and understand the procedures that they needed to follow. They observed the more experienced researcher and then practiced by replicating previous studies. One of my friends sent me this joke years ago. Why was Ivan Pavlov's hair so soft? Because he conditioned it. 